I'm guessing that your first reaction to the Old English poetry that we've looked at so far in the class is mostly, well, confusion. This poetry is weird. I mean, it's unusual, both in subject matter and in language. Cadman's hymn probably doesn't read much like any poem you've ever read before, even in translation. And Wolf and Ed Walker and the Wife's Lament, well, what the heck's even going on in those poems? One of the reasons why Old English literature is so hard to study is that there's so much we don't know about these works. In this regard, Cadman's hymn is actually kind of an outlier, since we do know when the poem was written and who it was written by, or at the very least we have a story that purports to answer those questions. But in most cases, we have very, very little information like that about Old English works. As we'll discuss when we read Beowulf, the most famous poem written in Old English, we don't know who wrote that poem or even what century it was written in. So we have to do a lot of detective work, and frankly, often a little bit of guesswork as well, in order to understand these poems. But with poems like Wolf and Ed Walker and The Wife's Lament, we're in much more complicated territory. Because in these works, we really can't tell what they're even referring to in many cases. And because so many Old English poems sort of refer to events obliquely, sort of assuming the audience can fill in the holes, we're at a real loss because we're not part of that original audience, and as a result, we have a real hard time filling those holes. Sometimes the difficulty we have has simply to do with the result of the distance in time between the language we speak and the language these poems are written in. As I've already mentioned, we know Old English pretty well. I mean, we can tell what individual words in Old English meant. But we still have a hard time pinning down exactly what they meant or what the connotation would have been. Sometimes words have multiple meanings, and it's hard to know which meaning is the one that we should apply in, the, in this individual circumstance. So if we look at the first line of Wolf and Ed Walker, for example, in the translation I provided for you online, that line reads, He's as good as wild game given to my folk. In some other translations, the line is pretty similar. And in one other translation that I sometimes use, the first line reads, My people have been handed prey. Now, these lines are sort of confusing to begin with. We don't know who the folk is. We don't know who the he that's being referred to in this line is. But really, if we look at the original language of the poem, we find there are even more basic difficulties. The Old English, if we were to translate it literally, word by word, it would look something like this. To my people, it is as if someone has given them a gift. Well, that's very different from my people have been handed prey, or he's as good as wild game given to my folk. In both of those translations, that word gift is being translated as something that's going to be destroyed by the people. It's not a gift they're going to appreciate. Instead, they're going to consume it in some way, as if they've been handed food to eat. Obviously, if we translated it a little differently and said, it's as if my people have been given a present, or he's as good as a gift given to my people, the connotation of the line is completely different. It seems like a positive thing that the he, whoever he is, has been given to the people, whoever they are. But the situation actually is even more complicated than that. The word that I'm translating now as gift can, in fact, be translated as prey. It can also be translated as an offering or sacrifice, which is a little closer to prey than to gift, but not exactly the same thing. Sacrifice is usually given voluntarily, for example, whereas prey is something that's hunted. So that would be a very different translation. But that word could also be translated as battle or war. And so we could read the line as something like, it's as if my people have been given a battle, or they've been presented with a war of some kind. Well, that's a completely different reading of that line. Obviously, if we can't figure out what this one individual word means, we're going to have a hard time figuring out how we're supposed to think about that line and the rest of the poem. And this is a really important point when we think about, especially Old English, but really any work that has to be modernized or translated in some way. It's a question that I have to deal with as a teacher all the time, because for these very early works, I'm providing you with versions of the text that are not the original. 
We can't read Old English in the original, whether that's Cadman's Hymn or Wolf and Ed Walker or even Beowulf, which we'll start reading soon. And even when we get a little later into the class, it's really hard to read some of these works without some kind of help whether it's a translation or a modernized spelling or sometimes just things like footnotes. But any time we start offering those translations or those reading aids, we're interpreting the poem to some degree. In other words, we're coming up with a way we think this work should be read or what we think it's about, what we think it means. You know, in a way, there's no such thing as Wolf and Ed Walker, at least not now. I mean, perhaps originally the poem was clear enough to the audience that everyone who heard it or read it or understood it understood it in the same way. I don't think that's true, by the way, but even if it was true then, it's certainly not true now. Even if you read the Old English, and I can read Old English, by the way, but I don't know the right translation of that line because I'm not sure whether we should think of it as a gift or an offering or a sacrifice or pray or a battle. And as a result, whatever choice I make there when I translate that line, that's sort of dictating how I'm going to read the rest of the poem and what I think the poem is going to be about. So in a sense, rather than thinking of Wolf and Ed Walker as a single unified poem, it's really a multitude of poems. Every translator, and to some degree every reader, is going to come up with a different way of reading this poem, a different way of thinking about this poem. That's not a bad thing, by the way, but it is something that we should at least be aware of. Anytime we're dealing with a translated work, we're sort of at the mercy of the person translating it for us. But it's not just the language that makes this poem specifically difficult for us. The situation of the poem is also somewhat unclear to us, and this doesn't have to do with the linguistic distance between modern and English so much as it does the social distance between the modern world and the early English world. There are just so many things we don't know about how people interacted with each other at this time, which was, you know, over a thousand years ago, and as a result, we don't exactly know how we're supposed to understand the situation of this poem. To some translators, to some readers, this poem is about a love triangle. There are possibly three figures here. The speaker, who most translators and most scholars interpret as a female, and then two males, Wolf and Ed Walker. But the nature of the triangle is something the critics do not agree on. I think the most common reading is that Ed Walker is the speaker's husband, and Wolf is perhaps her lover. But there are also translators and critics who have read it in exactly the opposite way, where Wolf is her husband and Ed Walker is her lover. And in fact, some readers don't read it as a love triangle at all. One really interesting interpretation of the poem is that it's spoken by a mother, that this is a mother speaking about her son, Wolf, and maybe Ed Walker is her husband, and she's speaking to him about their shared son, who is out in battle and who she's very concerned about. To be honest, we're not even entirely sure that the speaker is female. There's general agreement on that point, but I have to say it's a fairly unusual situation. There's really only one other poem in Old English that most critics believe is spoken by a female, and that is The Wife's Lament, which is, was also assigned. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not a female speaker. There are certainly textual cues that suggest that the speaker is probably a female, and that there's some kind of male-to-female relationship, whether romantic or otherwise, being discussed in the poem. But, I mean, really, that's a pretty loose hold we've got on the poem. If all we can say is that this is a poem spoken by somebody who's probably female, who has some kind of relationship with two males, Wolf and Ed Walker, but we don't know what that relationship is. Obviously, there's still a lot we don't know about this poem. With a poem like The Wife's Lament, the situation is a little clearer. In this poem, we're pretty sure that the speaker is a woman. The context of the poem, the way lines read, certainly suggests that when she talks about her lord, this isn't a warrior speaking about his king, but rather a woman speaking about her husband or lover. And we're pretty sure what her basic problem is. She's separated from her husband. She's lamenting. In other words, she's complaining about the fact that she can't be with her husband. What we don't know is the cause of the separation. 
Why are they separated? And we also don't know how the husband feels about that separation. Some readers have read it as the husband has banished her, that he sent her away. He's decided they can't be together again, possibly because of the plots and schemings of his kinsmen. But it's also possible that he has been banished, that he has maybe been sent away or has sent himself away to try to protect her for some reason. And in that case, she imagines him being solitary and friendless as well, and perhaps missing her. But it's also possible that those are just her sort of longings, her desires, that she wishes to believe he felt like she did. Well, these are all questions we have to deal with. We also have to deal with things like, why is she living in a cave under an oak tree? Is there some sort of symbolic significance to that locale? And the answer is, we really just don't know. Sometimes, students get really frustrated by these poems, by the fact that there's not a clear answer to the poem, and by the fact that we don't know that much about them, that we have a hard time figuring out what they're about. And I understand that frustration. I think there's a natural desire to try to make sense out of things. But I would like to suggest that the fact that we don't know exactly how to interpret the poems may not just be a failure on our part. In other words, it may not just be that we don't know enough about the language or the context, and that if we did, we'd be able to figure them out clearly. It may, in fact, be somewhat purposeful. In fact, I would suggest that these poems may have been written in a way to foster that ambiguity. Early English authors loved ambiguity, and that's a word we should maybe think about a little bit. I think most of us know basically what the word means. It means that we're not entirely sure about something. If something's ambiguous, it's not entirely clear how we're supposed to think about it. But the word actually comes from a Latin verb that meant, well, that the ambi at the beginning of ambiguity or ambiguous is the same prefix that we see in ambidextrous, which means that you're both left-handed and right-handed, right? The root word for ambiguity meant something like to drive both ways. In other words, it's describing a path that you could go both ways on. Maybe you can think of it metaphorically as a sort of fork in the road, but a fork where both sides of the fork get you somewhere. And that's the way ambiguity often works. Rather than being a negative thing, rather than being a lack of something, a lack of meaning, ambiguity can be, and I think was seen by the authors of Old English poetry, as a greater potential for meaning. In other words, because these poems can be interpreted more than one way, they're actually richer works than one that would just have a very clear and sort of laid out meaning or way of reading it. You know, if you think about the features of Old English literature that we've looked at so far, some of them do tend toward ambiguity. Kennings, for example. When we discussed Cadman's hymn, we talked about kennings, which are those compound words that have a metaphorical meaning. So the whale road is the sea, the road that the whales go on. Well, kinnings are by their nature ambiguous. In other words, they have two different meanings. They have a literal meaning, a road that whales are on, but they have a metaphorical meaning, the sea. And I think that kinnings were valuable to early English poets because they forced the reader to think about things, to think about both meanings at the same time. It's interesting to point out here that early English authors were very fond of riddles. For example, in the manuscript that contains both Wolf and Ed Walker and The Wife's Lament, there's also a series of riddles. More than 60 riddles are contained in this manuscript. And riddles, when you think of it, are kind of like Kennings and kind of like Wolf and Ed Walker to some degree in that they play around with multiple meanings. There's sort of a literal way to read it, and there's other, more meaningful way to read it. And in fact, riddles, by definition, don't give you the answer. You have to figure out what is meant by the text. That's part of the enjoyment of the riddle. So I think that when we look at Old English literature, rather than being frustrated by our lack of knowledge, maybe we should embrace that uncertainty as a feature of the literature itself. I know, speaking just personally, I like literature that makes me ask questions. I don't like texts that sort of lay out a meaning for me. I like to have to think about things, and I like there to be multiple ways of thinking about things. I think it's empowering for readers to know that there are different ways of reading this poem or that poem, and you might interpret a particular word differently than I interpret it. And that that might not just be okay, 
but it might in fact be the very point of the poem itself. In other words, for me at least, it's these questions, these uncertainties, the lack of a clear path, the ambiguity, in other words, that makes the literature worth reading. If you have any questions, let me know.